Welcome to Money in Politics, a program brought to you by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. Tonight we're going to talk about how the influence of money in politics may represent a dangerous threat to the health of our democracy right here in Minnesota. We have with us this evening three speakers who will present their points of view on this topic, and then we will be opening the program to questions from the audience. My name is Joan Higginbotham, and I'll be moderating this night's program. Our panelists this evening on my right, Nicholas Harper. Nicholas is a board member of the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, and he's an attorney here in the state of Minnesota. Our second speaker is Sherry Knuth. She is the policy and outreach manager for the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. And Gary Goldsmith is our third panelist, and he is the executive director of the Minnesota Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. We're going to look at the state, the national, and some ideas for reform here in the state of Minnesota, and we begin with the national perspective, and that will come to us from Nicholas Harper. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I only have a quick short period to explain. Um, I'm going to talk about campaign finance from the federal level, um, and that for moderate campaign finance is about 40 years or more depending on your perspective. Um, and there are entire legal textbooks written about this subject. So I'm gonna try and condense it down and simplify it as much as possible. Um, before we start, um, a couple of clarifications. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know, if I refer to a PAC, that means a political action committee, which is type, a type of organization that uh, campaign um, finance uh, regulations apply to, um, that organizations uh, corporations, labor unions, um, and candidates use um, in order to finance their campaigns. It's a special kind of body. Also, um, when I talk about corporations, I'm referring not only to uh, for-profit corporations, but also some non-profit corporations as well. Um, so campaign finance, um, the modern version, really uh, when we talk about modern campaign laws, we talk about the uh, Federal Election Campaign Act in 1972, which was amended in 1974 after the Watergate scandal, um, which is when it really gained its teeth. Um, it established the um, FEC, uh, which regulates campaign finance issues at the federal level. And then also, there is also the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, uh, which also is the main federal statute that covers campaign finance law. But I'm going to talk mostly about specific cases in the Supreme Court over the years that have affected those statutes and how the statutes apply um, at the federal level. And then also because those cases use constitutional issues, they apply to the state level as well, even though at issue were federal laws. The first major case that really defines money in politics is Buckley versus Vallejo in 1972. In that case, there were a couple different disclose, uh, a couple different issues that were brought up, but um, two different issues were the main focus. First were campaign contributions, and then second were independent expenditures. C campaign contributions are when an individual or a PAC gives money to a candidate in their campaign. So. Uh, and then the, the, can the candidate gets to choose how to spend that money. Independent expenditures, on the other hand, are when an individual or a PAC spends the money on an ad or other communication that they themselves have created. It's uh, completely separate from any control from the candidate. Um, those were the two main issues um, that were decided on in Buckley. Uh, The court decided in that case that contributions and expenditures were fully protected uh, speech because all speech requires, or most speech, almost all speech, requires spending money in some form. That was the court's um, rationale. And that's where we kind of get this idea that money is speech. Um, and that is kind of what started um, a number of cases in the Supreme Court system uh, related to money and speech and money in politics um, and those issues. The reason the court came to this decision is because the First Amendment, um, which covers the freedom of speech, um, because money was determined to be speech, not pure speech, uh, the 
First Amendment has a special legal test. It's called strict scrutiny, which means that in order to justify that kind of law, you have to have a, and these are kind of magic words for the court, compelling government interest, and that the law must be narrowly tailored to further that interest. So what that means is the court has to have, a, the, that the state has to have a very good justification for enacting these laws. The compelling interest the state argued, or the federal government argued in this case, in, for regulating money in politics was corruption. And not only actual corruption, but also the appearance of corruption. And the Supreme Court agreed. In that case, the, the court agreed that corruption and the appearance of corruption were very important um, and were a justification in order to enact these laws. Now, when I talk about corruption, I specifically mean quid pro quo corruption, which most people consider to be bribery as being kind of the uh, most obvious example. It's a very narrow definition of corruption. Um, but for contribution limits, the court found that those limits were uh, constitutional. They said that limits on the amount that a, an individual or a PAC could give to a candidate was constitutional because it prevented corruption and or the appearance of corruption to the American public. They found that independent expenditures, however, by virtue of being independent, were not, did not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption, and therefore any laws that regulated those were not constitutional. So that's where you get money in politics. The next big case that everyone, of course, has heard of is Citizens United in 2010, and that was controversial because the, the case, the, the Supreme Court turned over other precedent that the Supreme Court had set. So the Supreme Court kind of flipped their opinion on this. Um, and that's why, part of the reason it's so controversial. Um, the court decided that the distinction between corporations and natural persons, like you and I, uh, in the context of free, free speech and independent expenditures was unconstitutional. That we couldn't distinguish between the two in terms of independent expenditures. And that's where you get the idea that corporations are people. The Supreme Court struck prohibitions on independent expenditures by corporations from their corporate treasuries. Most corporations, they had used PACs in order to make ads or, uh, a, and um, have independent expenditures, but, in, but after this, corporations were allowed to make independent expenditures directly from their corporate treasuries. The court also clarified the idea that, corp that corruption is only quid pro quo. It explicitly held that influence, access, and favoritism from a political level was not corruption. And that's also another issue that a lot of people, um, especially reformers, have had um, with that decision. Um, now, to be clear, direct contributions from corporate treasuries are still banned by federal law and by state law in the state of Minnesota. So those. Um, it causes some confusion for some people, but direct contributions from corporate treasuries are still illegal. Uh, the next case, however, and this is actually the most recent one, is McCutcheon in 2014. It just came out in April, I think. Um, and in that case, the, um, the two statutes that I mentioned, they have two different limits on contributions. They have base limits and aggregate limits. Base limits are the amount that an individual or a PAC can contribute to a individual candidate during a, a certain period. Um, aggregate limits, however, are the amount that that individual or PAC can give to all candidates in a certain period. The government tried to argue that, they, that aggregate limits were important because they helped prevent uh, candidates and individuals from skirting around the base limits because they were afraid that certain candidates and certain committees would re-contribute money. The court did not buy that. The court said that, that re the re-contribution of funds was implausible, that most candidates used their funds, and they also noted that the laws did not actually ban the re-contribution of funds but, ban but put this aggregate limit. So the court held that it wasn't narrowly tailored enough. So you have these different issues about um, the campaign contributions and the individual expenditures and their interaction with the First Amendment and free speech. 
Um, two other issues that I'd like to point out that I think are major themes that a lot of people discuss. In regards to corporations or people, that has been a concept that has actually been around a very long time. There has been um, law kind of pointing to that, and people have cited cases as far back as 1819 um, to where we have considered corporations to be people. And typically, we enjoy this. We enjoy that corporations are people because it allows corporations to enter into contracts. It allows corporations to sue and to be sued. The issue is when corporations began to have constitutional rights in the same way that natural individuals uh, had constitutional rights. And that became a problem for people. And finally, I'd like to point out that disclosure and transparency has been an issue throughout all these cases that were upheld. All of the court um, decisions upheld disclosure requirements and transparency requirements by statutes. And there's only been one justice who has ever disagreed with that, and that was Justice Thomas. And he's only, he was, I think, the only one. Um, most other cases have supported disclosure requirements. Anyways, that's a super condensed version of lots of uh, federal law. Thanks, Nicholas. So we've now heard the federal aspects of uh, campaign finance. Now we're going to move on to our second panelist, and that is uh, Gary Goldsmith, who is the executive director of the um, Minnesota Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. And he will talk about what is happening in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. <clears throat> Uh, I'm happy to report that Minnesota has an active agency in the form of six board members who are looking out for um, your interests as citizens uh, in learning uh, how money is raised and spent for elections at the state level. Actually, the board is celebrating its 40th anniversary. We came into existence just after uh, the Federal Election Commission and on the heels of the Buckley decision that Nick was talking about. Um, if you have other questions about the board, I'll be happy to take them in the question period. I want to actually spend my remaining nine minutes or so on two questions. First of all, can we ever regain control of spending on elections in Minnesota? And secondly, if we can't, can we ever get thorough disclosure of who's actually behind all that spending? And on the first question, I say the answer is probably not. Um, as Nick pointed out, the courts have held now um, um, without uh, dispute that you cannot regulate the amount of money that either an individual or a corporation can spend independently of candidates. And so that door is open and I see no way that that door will ever close again. Um, actually, Buckley also held that you cannot limit the amount of money that an individual can spend of their own money to get elected. Now you might think we have spending limits in Minnesota, and we do, but that's because we have a voluntary system where people sign a contract with the board to limit their spending, and as a result, they get public subsidy payments, direct payments of tax dollars to help with their campaign. And that program has actually helped keep Minnesota elections among the cheapest in the country for a state of our size. <clears throat> Um, independent spending, however, is booming, and it's a booming business. Um, it's not just corporations and associations affiliated with them. Uh, prior to Citizens United, party units were the biggest independent spenders. Um, with Citizens United, we've seen more of that money flow into what Minnesota calls independent expenditure committees. They're like super PACs at the federal level. They can raise unlimited money from each donor that wants to give to them. They can spend unlimited money independently from the candidates. And there's limited disclosure because they only disclose really up one level. So if another group gives to them, like a nonprofit corporation, we'll see that group as the donor, but we don't know where that corporation got any of its money. And that's an issue the board, the Campaign Finance Board, has been working on. Um, our experience has been that Citizens United so far hasn't put a lot more money into the system. It's rather moved it from associations that disclose fully to us to these super PACs or independent expenditure committees that funnel the money through some other group like a C4 corporation or a trade association. And so while the money hasn't gone up too much, the amount of disclosure has gone down, I think, significantly. Um, so I don't see any way in Minnesota that we're going to be able to further limit um, the amount of spending. It's only going to go up unless some huge shift in uh, judicial uh, prudence at the Supreme Court level takes place, and that's not likely. 
But what about better disclosure? I think there's some hope there. As Nick said, eight out of the nine justices in Citizens United uh, upheld the disclosure provisions of the federal law that they were concerned with. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> in uh, deciding to, to allow corporations to use their own money to make unlimited expenditures, the Citizens United Court envisioned a disclosure system that doesn't exist. Doesn't exist at the federal level, doesn't exist at the state level. Um, they envisioned instant disclosure online where you could see where money was coming from and where it was going, and that doesn't exist anywhere. Um, California might be getting a little bit in that direction. They're actually trying to get up more than one level to find where the original source of money comes from, some either human being or business corporation that earned the money in their business, but not just a filter through which money flows. What are the problems with disclosure in Minnesota right now? And, and my board is aware of these. We've worked to eliminate them, and Sherry will have more to say about that. But there are two areas where we don't get disclosure. One is based on what the statute says must be disclosed. And this goes back partly to Buckley versus Vallejo, but there were cases in between. Um, for these independent groups, the law says in Minnesota that you disclose only those communications that expressly advocate for the election or defeat of a candidate. And Buckley said that means using words like vote for and vote against. Minnesota's law isn't quite that specific. The board hasn't decided exactly what expressly advocates means. But for example, if you listen to TV very much these days, you have probably seen a commercial um, that talks about Governor Dayton and the Democrats and the big, beautiful new office building they're building by the Capitol. And the people in the uh, commercial complain that their real estate taxes have gone up as a result and that the man changing his tire wishes that they would spend the money to fix roads and potholes. Now that's put on by a, an organization who is spending the money independently and is not registered with the campaign finance board, does not report the expenditures or where the money came from. And that's because that commercial isn't express advocacy. It doesn't say vote for or vote against or anything that really makes it clear to you. Well, I should correct that. You're intelligent people. I think it's clear to you who you're supposed to vote for or against, but it doesn't say that in the words of the commercial. And that's one of the areas that the board wants the legislature to work on, is defining what's subject to disclosure. Um, the other issue is in what you disclose even for an expenditure that is subject to disclosure, and this is that issue of going up one level. Um, as I said, an independent expenditure committee will disclose the corporation or the nonprofit corporation that gave it money. For example, the Sierra Club or the NRA donated $100,000, but we don't know anything about where the Sierra Club or the NRA got that money. Now, for those groups, that's probably not too material because they have thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of donors, all fairly small. But what about an organization like Americans for Prosperity, which has been linked, at least in the media, to the Koch brothers? We don't know because we don't have any reporting from them. Or some other group that we don't know anything about at all being the donor to one of these registered PACs. We don't know if that group got five contributions or one contribution or a 1,000 contributions. Um, we do have a law that does go a little bit into the depth of the underlying sources of that donor, but it's so weak in Minnesota as to be almost totally ineffective. Um, when we tried to get this law changed in the last couple of sessions, we had opponents, including um, a couple, uh, the NRA was one, and a local um, Right to Life group was another. Um, the NRA said that our effort, the board's effort, was dangerous, Politically motivated measures aimed at suppressing political speech by membership organizations such as the NRA pose a grave risk to freedom of speech, impose excessive regulatory burdens and, on political and commercial interests. That's the picture they're painting, and all the opponents paint that same picture. It's just terrible, hurts jobs. What is the picture that proponents of better disclosure are painting? Well, it's good, we want sunlight, we want uh, everybody to know where the money is coming from. It's not a very threatening picture. Um, it doesn't convey, I think, very much of a sense of urgency like the, the uh, republic is going to fall if we don't have this disclosure. 
Um, some commentators have suggested that the argument ought to be styled in terms of dark money, hiding big donors, influencing legislators, and everybody in campaign finance regulation that I know of disagrees with the Supreme Court's holding that says independent spending cannot have an influence on an elected official. And I know that from experience. Even the threat of independent spending can have an influence on the, um, uh, the vote and the attitude, certainly, of an elected official. Um, so I think you have to change the conversation. Um, you have to get many more people involved. Uh, one of the groups opposing the uh, actions the board tried to have the legislature take uh, claims to have 70,000 members in Minnesota. Most of these groups are groups that have members who are politically active, who will contact their legislator, legislator by email uh, when they're asked to do so, and legislators are flooded with emails and they respond to those. In some sense, I get the picture from our experience that it's not always just the money, and maybe that's a good thing because it's these groups with many, many active members who also vote who get the legislator's ear, and really money has nothing to do with that part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now our next speaker is going to talk about some reform efforts, and of course that would be the League of Women Voters who's involved in that, and our speaker is Sherry Knuth. Thank you for having me here tonight. The League of Women Voters of the United States uh, formed positions on campaign finance and money in politics after the Watergate scandal. And it's the general position that the League works under is to support incremental reform measures while working toward pu public financing as the final solution. So, um, and that's what we're doing here at the League in Minnesota and the U.S. League. One of the things, I think we're seeing a really dark picture here tonight. And I think we have to keep in mind that we're early in, it's really not been very many years since Citizens United was decided in 2010 and since some of these changes have occurred to really bring, bring the really big dollars into our system. People are still reacting and people are trying to find ways to deal with it. If you listen to the media, you hear you know, a variety of efforts that are being made around the United States. And um, here in Minnesota, we um, are working with the, LW, the U.S. League, which is going to convene a new study committee to address the issue, address uh, what changes should be made in the wake of Citizens United and McCutcheon. And we're also taking efforts at the state level ourselves to try to improve disclosure and move the needle on making this issue stronger in the eyes of citizens and public officials and working toward longer term solutions. So one of the things that Gary mentioned was the effort in the last legislative biennium to improve disclosure of independent spending. And that's where we see this loophole about um, ads that go on TV but don't use magic words such as vote for or vote against don't have to be disclosed. The people behind those ads don't have to be disclosed. So we, the League is, con is advocating at the legislature um, in, in favor of the disclosure legislation and we're asking our members and the public to let their legislators know that they support this disclosure measure. And um, Gary mentioned a couple of the groups that are uh, against the in enactment of new disclosure legislation. It doesn't matter to me what those groups stand for in terms of the public policies they're trying to affect, but it does matter that special interests are preventing disclosure legislation about what special interests are doing. We, that information should be public. The Supreme Court repeatedly uh, says that disclosure is recommended and in fact, the internet should be used as a way to allow citizens to get ready access 
to money and politics and who's trying to influence their vote. So in addition to um, supporting the disclosure legislation, the League here in Minnesota is seeking improvements in the Minnesota Campaign Finance Board website. And I'm happy to say that, in fact, that is underway. And um, just in the past couple weeks, the Minnesota Campaign Finance Board has been soliciting comments uh, from interested parties about what should that website look like. And the thing that the League really would like to see is databases that are accessible to people like you and me, to the media, to watchdog groups. I think the uh, Campaign Finance Board has been underfunded in terms of what it needs to accomplish here in Minnesota, and it's done the best it could with the website as exists. But we'd like to see a website that has a user-friendly guide and a user-friendly model. And I just want to take an aside and say that I think the Campaign Finance Board does great work, and Gary Goldsmith and other members of it are wonderful advocates in our state for trying to protect um, our democracy. So a third thing that the League is interested in seeing is looking towards small donor empowerment models. What a small donor empowerment model is, is if uh, I put $50 toward uh, my, uh, the candidate running in my district for a, a house seat, for instance, if Minnesota had a small donor empowerment model, that contribution could be matched on five or six to one. So if I make a $50 donation and we have a five to one match, that becomes another $250 for that candidate. And this has really just basic day-to-day -day practical implications. So much of our people running for office have to spend so much time raising money. If they were able to go to groups of small donors and have contributions by small donors enhanced by public funding, it would really make sense for them to spend more time with small donors, to do more grassroots work. And it amplifies the voice of small donors who are able to have, spend more time with the candidates and speak their mind about what they'd like to see for their district and the state. So, uh, so right now in the United States, there are some municipalities that use small donor empowerment models, such as New York City. So far, it has not been adopted at a state level. There was an attempt to do that in New York in the past year. But so this is something that we need to work for on uh, you know, a longer term goals. But um, I want to be the one to say some encouraging things, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a really important issue. And maybe the biggest issue, though, is not really the big money that's being spent but the sense of apathy and cynicism that many people, including some of us, feel about how to address this problem. That's probably the bigger issue. Where is the outrage? Where are people saying, this is really wrong? I think, um, as so we want to offer real, real solutions that we can move forward in real time. And, I, Encourage you to speak to your legislator. Encourage you to um, communicate with your friends and talk about, you know, this is a big problem, but the United States, we faced other big problems in the United States and we've chipped away at them and made an impact. So I hope you'll um, take away from this that there is there are opportunities here. And Gary mentioned that it's hard to message on this issue. Unfortunately, big frame democracy messaging doesn't work very well. So one of the things we're exploring is messaging to try to personalize the message we say to voters or citizens. And we're working on what that might be, but it's to say things like if a, a large donor is contributing to uh, candidates and 
supporting policies that damage clean water, the outcome is that you're going to have dirty water, polluted water. So the idea behind the messaging, and it's been worked on in focus groups, is to personalize that we need to tie this to what's going on in real people's lives. And there are ties. It's just that it's hard to dig in and establish some of those ties. So this is something we're going to be working on and uh, bring out to the public as, as we try to reform in this area. Thank you. Well, we've had some heavy information our way right now. And it's your opportunity to dig in a little deeper with your questions. And I know there are uh, paper note cards for you to fill out. And so if someone would bring those questions up, we'll start off with those. And I'm sure we will have plenty of issues to dig into here tonight. Thanks, first of all, to our speakers for bringing us really good, concise information on a very, very complicated topic. Okay, let's see what we have. Um, this is one just to sort of clarify. If you don't use the magic words such as vote for or vote against, how do you define what topics are uh, require disclosure? Maybe that would be something for the campaign finance board. Sure, I've been, I've been looking at this question a lot. I've uh, been looking at this question a lot just over the last couple of weeks as I examine a lot of the communications that are out there right now. Um, the board did propose a, um, an approach to this, and it's actually an approach that's not original. Um, it comes directly from Chief Justice John Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court in a couple of cases, or a case that came after Buckley called Wisconsin Right to Life. And Justice Roberts said, you don't really need the magic words before you can get disclosure or regulate a piece of literature. If the literature is so clear that no reasonable person could understand it to be anything other than an attempt to influence the vote in an election, then you can get disclosure for that piece of literature. And that's called the functional equivalent of express advocacy. And so the board is looking at how we might write that into law. It's been a, a recommended by the league and by the board. Um, so it still gives the benefit of the doubt to the speaker. If you could look at the ad and say, well, this has some other purpose, then that's fine. It's not going to be subject to disclosure. But if nobody in a room of reasonable people sees it as anything other than to influence an election, then it would be subject to disclosure. Now, somebody is making an assumption here saying, if public funding isn't the solution, what is? And I guess the league's long-term solution would be public funding. Mm -hmm. So let's, Nick, do you have any opinion on that? And then we'll ask Sherry to weigh in. I, um, well, especially in the federal level, and it, it, this only could happen on the federal level, there has been a lot of talk about making constitutional amendments um, related either to corporate personhood or money in politics or both. Um, I think just last week, actually, there was the um, Democracy for All Amendment um, was in the Senate. Um, it died due to a procedural vote, but it was the first amendment of its kind to gain um, a majority, more than 50 votes in the Senate. Um, what would it do particularly? That constitutional amendment would have allowed, um, I don't remember the exact phrasing, of course, but it was a fairly short amendment. It would have proposed an amendment to the Constitution that would have allowed the regulation of money in politics, basically, and would have allowed for um, regulatory bodies, states and federal, to distinguish between natural persons and corporate entities. There was a lot of support um, from a lot of reformers. One that stands out that um, did not support the amendment was the American Civil Liberties Union because they believed it was too broad um, and would have really um, burdened free speech rights generally. Oh, and I thought, Gary, you were sort of leaping forward there. <laughs> uh, generally, I agree with Nick. I, I would say, first of all, that with regard to controlling money in elections, the, the corporate personhood issue isn't really going to make a difference, even if they um, say corporations aren't people, because you have all sorts of non-corporate associations of people who always were allowed to make these kinds of expenditures. But the key part of the constitutional amendment that would be important is to make it clear that regulation of money and political speech is not an infringement on the First Amendment. That would take a constitutional amendment. 
and I guess I, I would pose to Sherry, since um, she's sort of the advocate of this, is that how does small donor empo empowerment or public financing resolve the problem of the overall cost of elections when it can't possibly address independent expenditures as the court has currently permitted them? Well, Gary threw me a tough one there. Um, I don't think that small donor empowerment is, answers all the problems in the system. I think it's really important that we have disclosure by independent spenders and hold those independent spenders accountable. And that's tough when you have loopholes in your disclosure laws. So we really want to see those loopholes closed and have dynamic databases accessible to people on our, uh, accessible on the internet so that we can hold people accountable when they take certain votes or um, when they um, are espousing a certain position during their campaign. I um, just want to add that the LWB of the United States has not supported constitutional amendments. It is part of the study that's being undertaken right now by the US League. And the, it's not that, and so far, Part of the reason for not supporting them is concern about the length of time that it takes to uh, amend the U.S. Constitution, and you know it's a very it's a very difficult process for good reasons. So that's one of the things that uh, the U.S. League will be looking at, and uh, I think whatever its position on that is, we will continue to need to take other steps to address the current uh, situation as if a constitutional amendment were to be winding its way through uh, the system. Someone has asked a question that probably we should give a little time to, and they've asked about local elections, but what is the, uh, should we increase the amount that a citizen can give directly to a local candidate? And what are the, the, lo the levels of, uh, ca that you can contribute to can individual candidates. I think that's probably something that you know very well, <laughs> Gary. Um, I, I know it, but not all that well. But let me say that in uh, 2013, we the, we, the Campaign Finance Board, recommended um, that the legislature increase the amount that individuals could give to statewide candidates, not statewide, but state candidates, so your legislative candidates and your constitutional office candidates, and also uh, to increase the amount that those candidates could spend and still participate in the public subsidy program. And that, those recommendations passed, and they were partly uh, to help give the candidates their own voice back among the, uh, the din of independent spending, also, they were partly, at least the contribution limit increase, was partly to improve the constitutional standing of our disclosure system because we felt that requiring disclosure of somebody that gave just over $100 uh, might not stand the constitutional test of uh, balancing your privacy versus the public's right to know who's influencing elections. Now, the legislature didn't do anything about local races that year. Uh, they were $100 in a non-election year, and I think 300 in an election year, 500 someone's telling me. Um, but this, in 2013, the legislature did increase those limits as well. And in addition, in that bill, the legislature required um, local units of government all the way down to school board and townships that have websites to publish campaign finance reports on their website. And the filing officer is required to provide the campaign finance board with the link, and we publish all those links to local websites. So now you have, to the extent that they're out there, you have one place you can go, which is our website, to see all those local reports. Now this is, this is sort of the big enchilada question. Um, why should public money be used to fund elections? I think this is something um, that Sherry will touch on later, and it goes to the small donor empowerment um, public funding of elections, some people, opponents, will sometimes refer to it as subsidies for politicians. I personally don't know if I agree with that characterization of it. Um, I think that public funding, it does help to um, kind of 
it does help to kind of clear the air in terms of you have so many different interest groups um, making contributions. Public funding allows smaller candidates who wouldn't otherwise find support so easily from individuals um, to kind of gain access to the system, become candidates um, by small donations um, and through public funding um, programs. And I think that is helpful for not only the, from the perspective of money and politics and corruption, but also in terms of competitiveness and um, having more candidates to choose from in the election. Sherry? Well, my, main, my primary response to that question in my head is always, well, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so where's the best place to come from? It's got to come out. Of, I mean, it does take money to run election campaigns. These aren't bad people trying to uh, pad their pockets. They have, to, they have to have campaign offices and equipment and put out uh, flyers or mailings or wh whatever. And, and so there has to be money to support campaigns. And if it comes from the public trough, it's not uh, being tainted by special interests. Our elected leaders can represent citizens and not be dependent on their, what special interests want to achieve. I'd like to comment on that too. I think um, Minnesota, by the way, has, has two components to its public funding. First of all, there's the direct payment, which I've referred to as the public subsidy program. Uh, candidates do have to raise a small amount from individual donors, from small donors, for a House of Representative candidates. That's $1,500 before they will get public subsidies. So they have to sort of qualify themselves a bit. We have another program called the Contribution Refund Program, where any candidate, again, who has agreed to limit their spending, can issue a receipt to a donor, and the donor can get back the first $50 that they donated to that candidate. Now, both of those come from the general fund. That's tax money of the state. Um, years ago, Minnesota had a sort of a measurement system called Minnesota Milestones, and, and I still think some of them are relevant. One of them was citizen involvement. We measure ourselves by citizen involvement, and the public subsidy program, including the contribution refund program, got people more involved because people who could not afford to donate $50 to a candidate could do that. They got to know the candidate that even that small donation, even when it's refunded, gives that citizen a bond with that candidate, makes that citizen more likely to get out and vote on election day, and that was important to Minnesota, and I think it should still be important now. The other uh, component, or the next component, is not only does it give these new, less known candidates some money, but because most candidates in Minnesota, more than 85% pub participate in the public subsidy program, overall cost of elections are low, so a person can come in and participate, not having to worry about getting all sorts of money from outside sources. And finally, I think Sherry touched on this, um, this program overall, again, by keeping the cost of elections low, gives the candidates time to communicate with voters instead of spending all their time in a room making phone calls for money. Well, the, the corollary, which I think we probably answered already, is if Minnesota were to increase the funding for election campaigns, where would the money come from? And I think we've already basically said that it would come from us, but in a different form. Yeah, it, it will come from us, and it, and it won't actually be a different form. It'll still be from the general fund, which is your general tax dollars. Uh, people sometimes uh, talk about the checkoff on your tax form where it says, shall you donate $5 to the DFL or the Republican Party? Even that, if you read it closely, does not affect your refund. It's a donation that you're directing the state to make from its general fund of tax dollars. So it all comes from tax dollars. I think that Minnesota, that the Campaign Finance Board very well may recommend an increase in the overall public funding for public subsidy. And that's because of a new case that uh, Nick didn't touch on, he talked about McCutcheon. Um, McCutcheon said that from the candidate's side, you can only take so much, uh, I'm sorry, from a donor's side, you can only donate so much and you'd have to spread it around a lot thinner than you otherwise could if you wanted to give it to everybody. 
we have a similar law on the candidate side, and it says you can only take so much from large donors, lobbyists, and PACs. And once you hit that limit, you can't take any more from that group of people. Um, there's a case in federal court right now called Seton versus Weiner. Uh, Deanna Weiner is the chair of the board. And at the district court level here in St. Paul, uh, the court, trial court judge struck down the part of our law that says candidates can only take a certain amount from large givers. These are people who give more than half of the otherwise high limit. So that limit is gone now. In Wisconsin, a similar limit applied to PACs just got struck down by a, a district federal judge. So those limits are gonna be gone, and I think if we wanna limit the amount of money that candidates can take from these pools of particular donors, like lobbyists, PACs, and really large givers, it's gonna have to be voluntary, which means it has to be by contract through the subs public subsidy program, and that means there's going to need to be more funding to keep that program uh, uh, beneficial to the candidates who agree to it. I just want to, I'd just like to add, um, I actually um, was doing a little research on that question about a month ago about where, where could the money come from for more public funding of campaigns. And one idea that I ran across was a tax on fees for media ads associated with elections. So, just an idea. Well, no, that, that would be a unique solution to the problem. I think we all like that, don't we? <laughs> well, that, that, another question that is a, sort of a little more esoteric, but what are the rules for that a, a group uh, has to follow if they're going to register as a PAC? And maybe, you, since you talked about what PACs are, Nick, I don't know if that's something you know um, off the top of your head. There are a lot of rules <laughs> for PACs, and that's about as much as, I mean. It's, it's easy. Really? <laughs> the, uh, if you read any court case where a group is challenging the registration reporting requirements, they make it sound like you have to have a campaign finance lawyer and jump through all sorts of hoops to do it. And that's absolutely not true. And someday, actually in some courts, uh, agencies have had the uh, opportunity to prove that, and the courts have agreed with them. Um, in Minnesota, if a group of two or more people want to register a PAC, um, it's a one-page form. You pick one of you to be a treasurer and the other to be the chair. It can be the same person even if you want it to be. You open a bank account and you file the one-page form with us. That's it. You're registered. Um, then you report on uh, money that you get and money that you spend. Um, you itemize only if you get more than $200 from a person or pay more than $200 to somebody. The legislature did just increase um, all of the thresholds for registration. So if you want to influence elections, even if you're two or three people working together, you can spend up to $750 and you don't have to do anything. No registration, no reporting or anything. And if you're doing it independently of candidates, you can spend up to $1,500 and you don't have to do anything. No registration, no reporting or anything. Um, by, besides that, we have a staff of nine people in St. Paul who answer our own phones and are always happy to help you. I just want to, I'd like to add one thing to that and um, suddenly I forgot. <laughs> what I was going to add. What was the question again? Well, I, I'm going to move on to the next one because I think you, you may remember it when I ask you about that because it's how do I find out about the money that has affected the campaign of a particular candidate? So if we want to find out where somebody's money came from. Okay. I remember what I was going to say. On NPR about a month ago, I heard a piece about a junior in high school in Minnetonka who is doing his uh, uh, project on campaign finance, and he registered a PAC. <laughs> yeah. And also, if you've ever watched Stephen Colbert, which is a comedy <laughs> show, Stephen Colbert did a piece, uh, I don't know if it was one or two years ago, a series with, uh, with a real campaign finance lawyer who came on the program. And they went through, well, what would I have to do to file a PAC? and what, would, what kinds of laws are restricting me. And I mean, it was amazing. I mean, the guy would just say, well, no, you just fill out this piece of paper and then that's it. And, and uh, actually, uh, one of the major United States newspapers reported that 
people learned more about campaign finance from the Stephen Colbert show than most other sources. So I'm mentioning it for a reason. <laughs> Now, what, um, how, do, how can you find out? Now, I know we talked a little bit about this earlier. How, how can you find out about, if you're interested in a candidate and who supports them, who helps to fund their campaign? Um, I'm sure that it's the Campaign Finance Board, but, but I think you have different opinions, so why don't we hear from both of you? Well, there are databases on the uh, Minnesota Campaign Finance Board website that you can go into and search by candidate name or um, can you search by uh, independent spenders and contributors? Yeah. Right. Um, as Sherry mentioned earlier, we've just embarked on a major project and it's gonna be probably certainly months and maybe a year, we'll be lucky if it's done in one year or two, revamp our whole website. The data is all there almost now, but not all that well organized or easy to access. The easiest thing is if you know the candidate's name, you can, there's a, it says candidates at the top, and you click on that, and it says view reports, and you can go right to see images. These are not data, these are images of their file reports. Most of them are filed electronically, so they're easy to read, and you can see the reports way back into the uh, turn of the 2000s um, for all the candidates. Um, we also do have searchable data. We just modified our searchable data uh, user interface to make it a little easier, but you can pick a candidate and you can say, tell me all the donors to that candidate for as many years as we have in our system. Or you can pick a donor or you can pick a group of donors and say, tell me all the people that donor uh, has given to in the years that are in our system. Or you can narrow it to specific years. Um, where we're going is to improve the data, to make uh, it more searchable, um, to create a page, for example, where you can uh, enter the name of a person, a candidate, for example, and you'll see everything about that candidate accessible on one page. All the reports, all of the um, complaints that might have been filed against the candidate, probably even a link to what that candidate has done in the legislature. So um, there's a lot of data there already, and we're going to make it better. And again, if you have questions about how to access it when you actually get on the website, give us a call. And while I was pre uh, preparing for this uh, event today, I, I was thinking, what if we asked candidates in our candidate forums who their major funders for their campaign were? Mm. Now, we, theoretically, would they know? I think most of them do. I remember when I was working for Common Cause, someone, a local candidate here said, well, I don't know those numbers because that's all my, my treasurer. I have nothing to do with that. His credibility slipped in my eyes. <laughs> in, in relation to the original question, um, there's also a couple of different um, nonprofit organizations, third, third party organizations that um, do track and analyze campaign finance information. On the federal level, there's the Sunlight Foundation, um, and then there's also followthemoney.org, which is the National Institute on Money and Politics. Um, and they do state level um, money. And they have websites that um, use the information from state websites and from the FEC. But then they also do additional analysis, and they also have their own systems that um, make it uh, for a lot of people find it to be um, easier to read through and, and, to, and to analyze um, the financial information provided. Great, so you can find that information on your, using your computer. Now this is a question, I'm, I'm not sure if, what um, the answer is. What is the role of the state attorney general in uh, researching corporate or nonprofit donations to candidates or political parties? Is there a role? Uh, not really for the Attorney General. The Attorney General's office tends to stay out of enforcement in the campaign finance area, although technically um, she would have some authority should she choose to move into that. Um, however, uh, in a, a recent case, the Attorney General avowed that she would not be enforcing the laws. And so uh, with regard to corporate contributions at the level of state elections, um, the Campaign Finance Board enforces that law. And for local elections, there's not really any enforcement agency, but complaints can be filed with the Office of Administrative Hearings. 
I, I might add one more thing. As I, I'm, I'm actually very proud of the board that I work for. Um, and people should know that we're not only a regulatory and a disclosure agency, but we're also an investigative agency. So if we see something that looks wrong on reports or we see something on television that looks wrong, or if somebody files a complaint, we actually investigate those matters and make a final determination. And so that's a big benefit to have an organization like that here in Minnesota. Well, our time is almost up, so I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us tonight. Sherry Knuth from the League of Women Voters, Gary Goldsmith from the Minnesota Campaign Finance Practices Board. I've got the old name. Uh, it's the Campaign Finance Board now, correct? Right. Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board used to be called Ethical Practices Board. Yes, and that's the name I remember. And Nick Harper, an attorney who's done some work, a lot of work actually, on campaign finance reform. Thanks to you for all your good questions tonight, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this forum. We hope that it will give you some ideas of how you can help to make our elections fairer for everyone, candidates and voters. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Good night. Thank you.